Many years later, as he bought his ticket to see Disney's Encanto, Jose Maria Luna was to remember that distant afternoon when his parents took him to discover cinema. Mainstream animation has served as children's introduction to film for decades, and I was lucky enough to grow up during the tail end of the Disney animation renaissance, the advent of Pixar, the mainstream western introduction to Studio Ghibli, and, most importantly, the release of Shrek 2's Latin American dub. Shrek? Por ti, baby. Sería Batman. Eso quisieras. And although I did love epic fantasies and body comedies alike, my queer little heart belonged to animated musicals. In fact, there's nothing I wanted more than a Disney animated musical set in Colombia. My favorite movies back then, Beauty and the Beast, Hunchback of Notre Dame, and Hercules were very European in setting and in origin, but I'd often, at times begrudgingly, gravitate towards whatever I could find that felt somewhat similar to my own origins. The Emperor's New Groove, although only vaguely Peruvian, was, and still is, hilarious and inventive enough to scratch some of that itch. Isma. And I would repeatedly watch The Road to El Dorado, even though I didn't particularly like it, because the titular myth came from my country, even if the movie didn't depict it as such at all. Hey, a video about that! So imagine my excitement even well into my 20s when Disney Animation Studios announced the release of Encanto, a new animated musical that would be set in, of all places, Colombia. Directed by Jared Bush and Byron Howard and co-directed by Charisse Castro-Smith, Encanto tells the story of Mirabel Madrigal, who was born into a magical family where everyone has a special gift. Except for her. You didn't get a gift? Her sister Luisa is super strong, her cousin Antonio can talk to animals, and her mom Julieta can cure any ailing with her food. But, as her abuela Alma will often remind her, Mirabel was never given a special gift, which is a regular source of tension between them. So the best way for some of us to help is to step aside. Let the rest of the family do what they do best. But these gifts aren't innate. They are given to the family by a magical candle they call their miracle, for this was the force that 50 years earlier saved Abuela and her three kids after violence forced them to flee their hometown. When the violence caught up with them killing Abuelo Pedro, the candle gave the surviving Madrigals a home, a magical house that has become the source of refuge, comfort, and the ensuing generation's special gifts. The movie follows Mirabel as she notices that the house, their casita, is beginning to show some cracks, which her abuela adamantly denies in an effort to maintain order. There is nothing wrong with La Casa Madrigal. The magic is strong! Mirabel's fear only grows when she consults an old prophecy from the family's ostracized uncle Bruno, whose gift of premonition was so overwhelmingly negative that it drove the family away. Burdened with the knowledge that she is central to her family's prophesied demise, it will now be up to Mirabel, the least special Madrigal, to find out what's going on with their miracle and to protect the one thing that has protected them all these years, their home. Now, although I suspected it from the prologue, since, you know, displacement is a reality that, unfortunately, millions of Colombians across history have been familiar with, it was this quest to save the beloved Madrigal home that made me realize that the movie wasn't just going to be set in Colombia, but that it would feel Colombian as well. No Marvel movie opening night could compare to the shared joy of an entire theater relishing in our common expressions, our beloved dishes, and uh, some very familiar family dynamics. How many times did I hear an uy, jaw coming from a stringer in the theater? And how about the squeals every time they showed our traditional flutes on screen? What could compare to the collective minute-long laughter when Mirabel's dad curses saying Miércoles. In the English version of the movie, no less, a joke I can only imagine is incomprehensible to Anglo audiences. Hell, the entire theater seemed ready to start dancing when Joy Arroyo's En Barranquilla Me Quedo played at the party. Everything from the geography, the architecture, the music, the plant life, the animals, and the art, the gestures, they all screamed Colombia. They even had a crazy enough set of characters to properly represent our weird, desperate little country. It's sunny, but it's like raining a lot. Peppa, what the fuck? But this is not a video about how much it meant to me, a Colombian, to see Encanto. For that, 
You can read the article I wrote for Polygon on the matter, link in the description below. <laughs> no, we are here to talk about how I don't think that it's those references that make the movie feel Colombian, at least not entirely. But what is it then? I think it's the solitude. Part 1. Macondo. Many years earlier, in 1952, Colombian journalist Gabriel García Márquez was to first conceive his magnum opus upon revisiting his hometown of Aracataca in order to help his mother sell their family home. Originally titled La Casa, the book was initially born out of an idea to set an entire novel inside a house. However, the novel soon outgrew this concept to become a journey through 100 years of an extended family's troubled history. Years later, in 1967, Garcia Marquez finally publishes the book, now titled 100 Years of Solitude. I'm gonna brag about my very early edition signed copy of the book. Ignore that, I stole this from my dad. Jose Arcadio Buendia and Ursula Guaran, two cousins who got married against their family's wishes, flee their hometown in the Caribbean coast of Colombia after Jose Arcadio murders a man who offended him. During their journey, Jose Arcadio dreams of a perfect city named Macondo and proceeds to found a town in the middle of nowhere. An idyllic town soon sprouts from the Buendia home, attracting people from all over the region who are looking for a place to live. Macondo is an Eden with a Romani caravan's annual visits as its only contact with the outside world. Many years later, as he faced the firing squad, Colonel Aureliano Buendia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice. At that time, Macondo was a village of 20 adobe houses, built on the bank of a river of clear water that ran along a bed of polished stones, which were white and enormous, like prehistoric eggs. The world was so recent that many things lacked names, and in order to indicate them, it was necessary to point. That is, until the railroad arrives, and with it, the real world and its real problems, which make the town's cracks begin to show. Every new development further builds on Ursula's fear of cosmic retribution for her marriage's original sin, its incestuous consummation. She's always half expecting the next Buendia baby to be born with the proverbial sign of incest, a pig's tail. It's difficult to summarize or recount the events of the novel because so much happens in it and not only is it often told out of conventional order, but a lot of what happens might often feel somewhat repetitive. This cyclical nature of the events that unfold and the character's actions further cement the book's statement about the repetitive, self-destructive nature of Colombian history. Even trying to explain the family structure is kind of complicated, like uh, Jose Arcadio and Ursula have three children, Jose Arcadio, Aureliano, and Amaranta. Jose Arcadio has a child with Pilar Ternera, who they name Arcadio, but then he uh, just moves out and spends his life with Rebecca, who is kind of his half-sister. They're not really related. Still weird. Aureliano also has a child with Pilar Ternera, and they name him Aureliano Jose. And on top of that, he also has 17 children from 17 different women, all named Aureliano. The kids, not the women. Amaranta, however, after rejecting several suitors, never gets married. Also, Aureliano did get married to Remedios, but she was a child bride and she died, so... Arcadio, in turn, marries Santa Sofia de la Piedad, who gives him three children. Jose Arcadio II, Aureliano II, and Remedios the Beauty. Out of them, only Aureliano II, despite his constant affair with Petra Cotes, gets married to Fernando del Carpio, who gives him three children. <laughs> Jose Arcadio, Aureliano, no. No. Amaranta Úrsula, Jose Arcadio, and uh, Renata Remedios. Who's a sister and who's a cousin? There's so many people! How do you keep them all straight? Okay, 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 okay. Renato Remedios has a forbidden love affair with Mauricio Babilonia, who is killed before his son, Aureliano Babilonia, is born. That son later grows up and meets his aunt, Amaranta Ursula, who he doesn't know is his aunt, and they begin a passionate love affair. Then they have one kid together, who they name Pedro. 
Just kidding, his name is Aureliano. He's Squidward, he's Squidward, you're Squidward, I'm Squidward! Are there any other Squidwards I should know about? Meow. The town grows along with the family, inviting all sorts of threats to its structure. The civil wars, for example, call Colonel Aureliano Buendia to go fight for the Liberal Party. And meanwhile, uh, his nephew Arcadio becomes a bloody dictator in Macondo. An American tourist tries a banana while he's visiting the town and he becomes so enamored with them that he brings over an American fruit company to take over Macondo and abuse the local workforce at the banana plantations. But this is not just like any fiction novel or even a historical fiction one. It is rather a staple of the very Latin American brand of magical realism. This genre is characterized by realistic, often historical events intermingled with magical elements that aren't necessarily seen as out of the ordinary by the characters in the story. Unlike fantasy, magical realism doesn't seek to remove itself from reality through magic, but rather to further explore it. This is why, for example, Macondo has an epidemic of lack of sleep at one point, or a priest uses chocolate to levitate and prove the existence of God. Uh, a soft fall of flowers carpets the entire town upon Jose Arcadio Buendias's death, and a trail of yellow butterflies follows Mauricio Babilonia around just like Renata Remedios' love for him does. It was then that she realized that the yellow butterflies preceded the appearances of Mauricio Babilonia. She had seen them before, especially over the garage, and she had thought that they were drawn by the smell of paint. Once, she had seen them fluttering about her head before she went into the movies, but when Mauricio Babylonia began to pursue her like a ghost that only she could identify in the crowd, she understood that the butterflies had something to do with him. Mauricio Babylonia was always in the audience, at the concerts, at the movies, at high mass, and she did not have to see him to know that he was there, because the butterflies were always there. Magic in 100 Years of Solitude is not there to embellish reality, but rather to expose it to tell the harsh truths that realism isn't necessarily emotionally equipped to deliver. Part 2. The Encanto of Macondo Years later, this novel that often reads as a grim eulogy for an entire population was used as the basis for a Disney animated movie. By the filmmaker's own admission, there is a lot of inspiration drawn from Garcia Marquez and 100 Years of Solitude specifically in Encanto. That love could never be. I don't understand. Oh, because she's his aunt and she has amnesia, so she can't remember that she's his aunt. You see, I say it's like a very forbidden. In fact, according to The Art of Encanto, the movie was originally conceived as a multi generational story set across a hundred years of a family's life. However, for the sake of simplicity, it simply became intergenerational instead. The family matriarch, Abuela Alma, in a very magical realist turn, builds a house in the middle of nowhere by way of her grief. Once again, it is a tragedy that gives way to the birth of the town, the Encanto, which is meant to be an isolated heaven from the country's problems. And so, in being a haven for displaced people from all over the country, it also becomes a microcosm for all of Colombia. That's why you have Caribbean, Zenu, Bogota, and all sorts of other cultures together in one place. This reflects the most basic high school level analysis of 100 years of solitude, that Macondo and everything that happens there and in the book is an encapsulation and reflection of Colombian history. There are countless other references to 100 years of solitude in Encanto, some more overt than others. Isabella, for example, is very reminiscent of Remedios the Beauty. Both are beautiful women who give the family a lot of social capital, but decide to ultimately go against what's expected of them. Isabella, by rejecting perfection and growing cacti, and Remedios by randomly flying away while folding the laundry. Same thing. Bruno himself seems to be the most Macondian of the Madrigals, serving as a bit of a composite of the first three Buendia children. Like Jose Arcadio, he leaves the family unit after clashing with his mother. Like Colonel Aureliano, he lives in a hidden corner of the house alone, cycling through repetitive tasks. The Colonel makes golden fish jewelry, Bruno heals the cracks. And, like Amaranta, he never gets married or has children, opting instead to live in solitude. Of course, Amaranta never got married because she saw herself as undeserving of loving and being loved, while we all know that Bruno hasn't gotten married because he's gay. <laughs> uh, 
they sure think I'm funny. Additionally, Bruno's vision evokes that same premonition in the book. Both the Buendia and the Madrigal house are prophesied to be destroyed because of the family itself. You also have the iconic yellow butterflies of the book as a motif across the movie, as a reminder of Alma's love for Pedro just like they were for Renata Remedios and Mauricio. Then there's the complicated family dynamics at the core, the intergenerational trauma and cycles of violence that are born out of a lack of communication and understanding between the members of the family. The curse of the Buendias, their solitude, came from the refusal to make a part of a lawyer unit, be that their family or their community. Okay, because there's been a lot of lying in this family. And a lot of love. But outside of the family, there is a historical context that frames the entire narrative. One that might stay at the outskirts for most of it, but will often sneak in and cross the characters. So why don't we talk about that context? Part 3. The unbearable solitude of being Colombian. There is honestly something almost quintessentially Colombian about the desire to heal an inherently broken country. While Americans argue over whether or not they should teach about racism in schools, I was 12 years old when we were being shown pictures of bloody massacres in social studies class, and that's having already grown up in a consistently violent news cycle. Like most Latin American countries, Colombia has a very complicated history, one that's often branded by sadistic, pervasive violence. If I were to give enough of a comprehensive run through Colombian history, this video would be several semesters long, but I do think that it's important to understand the historical context in which both 100 Years of Solitude and Encanto came to be. Indigenous civilizations such as the Muisca, the Zenú, the Tairona, Wayun, Nasa, and countless others were established across the geographically disparate territory at the northernmost tip of South America. Across the 16th and 17th century, Spanish conquistadores ravaged their population and colonized the territory, naming it the Viceroyalty of Nueva Granada. A key aspect of this conquest is the caste system established by the Spanish. In an effort to ethnically cleanse the native population, Spanish colonizers were encouraged en masse to take indigenous spouses. This resulted in a new racial group called mestizos, which translates to mixed. This forced miscegenation resulted in a confused identity for the majority of the population. You know, the joint historical baggage of the oppressed and the oppressors. The remaining indigenous communities were often enslaved by the Spanish, but due to their declining population, there was also an influx of enslaved African people that were brought to the territory through the Atlantic slave trade. The ensuing slave rebellions were the first instances of independentist thought in the Viceroyalty. Tensions between the Spanish crown and the colonies resulted in a decades-long independence process. The ideological schisms between the new government were exploited by the crown to violently reconquer the territory for a brief period of time until a new war finally resulted in the liberation of the colony in 1819. This divide, however, remained. Through the 19th century, there were nine civil wars between liberals and conservatives, culminating in the Thousand Days War where 2.5% of the population was killed. After the war, the urban elites managed to get a somewhat stable hold over the country and, most importantly, the mostly racialized rural underclass that they were exploiting. Class tensions only grew throughout the first half of the 20th century, although that went mostly ignored by the governing elites. That is, until the rise of Jorge Eliezer Gaitán, a humble lawyer turned populist leftist politician who threatened a bipartisan hold over the country with massive widespread support from the poor. But on April 9, 1945, during his second attempt to run for president, Gaitan was assassinated as he left his office in Bogotá. Riots erupted across the city and the entire country, which led to 10 years of violence during which at least 300,000 people died. This, along with the global advent of communism, gave birth to leftist guerrilla warfare, which for decades aimed to bring down the government and install the rule of the people often through terrorism that also targeted civilians. Far-right militias emerged in response, often carrying out severe witch hunts and massacres in the name of peace. Simultaneously, cartels began to emerge in the 70s and 80s in order to meet the demand for illegal drugs in the United States. 
These violent organizations practically control the country for years through terrorism, which is why you never bring up Pablo Escobar when you're talking to a Colombian. Like, you have no idea how many times I was in the United States and they asked me where I was from and I said I'm from Colombia and they were like, oh my god, like Pablo Escobar. And I'm like, no, why would you say that? We hate him. He's a horrible person who killed so many people, but like, you know, edgy people like to treat him like some kind of hero because he hated the American government. But like, who doesn't? You know, it's like if you told me like, oh, I'm from the United States and I was like, oh, like Dick Cheney? Like, no, I should start saying that to Americans. Like, what are they gonna do? Get mad at me? This is, of course, a very brief and honestly kind of generous summary of our national history. We'd be here all day, we talked about how people in the 80s were scared to leave their houses due to fear of cartel violence, or if we went into the horrible effects of American military interventionism during the failed war on drugs. At one point, the problems all get so mixed up with one another that it's hard to keep track of what led to what and how everything started, like, like a macro version of one of those family feuds that your aunt insists on maintaining. Because of this, Colombians tend to simply refer to this vast array of threats as the violence, as this abstract, omnipresent force that somehow encompasses a whole country's worth of trauma. In Encanto, Abuela Alma and her husband Pedro are victims of that violence, displaced from their hometown by a faceless entity that could have been any violent agent from our blood-stained history. As ubiquitous as this violence can be, it often comes with a sort of post-traumatic lack of memory, as explored in 100 Years of Solitude. In the book, when the banana workers strike against the American fruit company, the bosses agree to meet with them to negotiate new terms. The workers all gather at the train station to wait for them, but when the train doors open, they are met with dozens of soldiers firing into the crowd. The captain gave the order to fire and 14 machine guns answered at once. But it all seemed like a farce. It was as if the machine guns had been loaded with caps, because their panting rattle could be heard and their incandescent spitting could be seen, but not the slightest reaction was perceived, not a cry, not even a sigh, amongst the compact crowd that seemed petrified by an instantaneous invulnerability. Suddenly, on one side of the station, a cry of death tore open the enchantment. Ah, mother! A seismic voice, a volcanic breath, the roar of a cataclysm broke out in the center of the crowd with a great potential of expansion. José Arcadio II, one of the strikers, wakes up among piles of dead bodies on the moving train. He manages to escape and make it back to town as the only survivor of the massacre, but no one in Macondo seems to know what he's talking about when he tells him there had to be thousands of dead strikers at the station. There is no memory. And this isn't just an event in the book. In November of 1928, in the town of Cienega in the Caribbean coast of Colombia, the local workers of the United Fruit Company refused to work until the company agreed to grant them dignified working conditions. After the United Fruit Company refused to negotiate with them and under threat of invasion from the United States government if the company's interests were not protected, the Colombian government sent in the army to Cienega to meet with the strikers. As soon as those train doors opened to the station full of strikers, the army just fired into the crowd, resulting in a massacre of countless people. For decades, official statistics placed the death toll in the dozens, while, you know, in-person accounts claim it was in the thousands. What was done about this? Well, a young lawyer fought for workers' rights and accountability following the massacre. A young lawyer who would, years later, be assassinated as he left his office in Bogota during his run for president. Attracted by the smell of coffee, he went into a kitchen where a woman with a child in her arms was leaning over the stove. Hello, he said, exhausted. I'm Jose Arcadio Segundo Buendia. He pronounced his whole name, letter by letter, in order to convince her that he was alive. He was wise in doing so, because the woman had thought that he was an apparition as she saw the dirty, shadowy figure with his head and clothing dirty with blood and touched with the solemnity of death come through the door. There must have been 3,000 of them. What? The dead. It must have been all of the people who were at the station. The woman measured him with a pitying look. There haven't been any dead here since the time of your uncle, the colonel. Nothing has happened in Makondo. 
In the three kitchens where Jose Arcadio Segundo stopped before reaching home, they told him the same thing. There weren't any dead. So what happens when we are exposed to this much collective pain? Well, afraid that these evils will plague us again, we keep quiet about them. We bottle them up, leaving them to surface in unpredictable ways. And so our descendants live with the consequences of this violence, but not necessarily with the means to understand them. Those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it, they say, so we are stuck in this vicious cycle because we struggle to learn from one another. Abuela doesn't communicate her anxieties, but expect others to understand them. When they don't, tensions only grow and the madrigals are driven farther apart. These cycles of violence, indifference, and solitude are reflected in the book ending as well. The last Aureliano Buendia, product of his father's love affair with his own aunt, is born with the prophesied pig's tail, fulfilling Ursula's fear. Across seven generations, the Buendia family refused to escape their solitude, and the original scene was committed once again, bringing the dynasty to an end. Gabriel Garcia Marquez writes in the very last line of the book that Macondo would be wiped out by the wind and exiled from the memory of men at the precise moment in which the reader finishes reading the book because racist condemned to 100 years of solitude did not have a second opportunity on earth. If we are stuck in a chaos maintained by our own indifference, individualism, and self-defeat, do we even deserve a way out? Part 4. Responding with life. The thing about several centuries worth of violence, abuse, and death is that it can be hard to imagine a future that is free of all that. The rift between Abuela and Bruno serves to show the dynamics that we are dealing with, you know, the refusal to go through that again against the certainty that you will have to. That same rift reflects the reality of the country. There are established forces that are intent on aggressively fighting these threats and subversive ones, insisting that this will only perpetuate the violence further. That is why both the Buendia house and the Madrigal house are destroyed in the end. Conflict without communication can only end in that, the prophesied destruction of the unit and an overwhelmingly dire lack of future. That is where 100 years of solitude ends, with no second opportunity on Earth. In Canto, however... Because the Buendias are not meant to represent the everyday Colombian family. They are the elite. You know, it's the elite's own obsession with incestuously perpetrating itself and maintaining its own grip on reality that ends up sabotaging not just themselves, but also everyone around them. It is, after all, Jose Arcadio's own crime that drives him and Ursula away from his hometown. The Madrigals, on the other hand, are not the elite, but ordinary people, the victims of violence who are left to fend for themselves. Their house is rebuilt, not through the powers of the Madrigals, but through love, solidarity, and community. In spite of this, said Garcia Marquez when he accepted his Nobel Prize, to oppression, plundering, and abandonment, we respond with life. Neither floods nor plagues, famines or cataclysms, nor even the eternal wars of century upon century have been able to subdue the persistent advantage of life over death. That life, that love, takes the shape of the trail of yellow butterflies that always follows Mauricio Babilonia around in 100 years of solitude. His forbidden love affair with Renata Remedios Buendia transcends the reality of her family's wishes for her, but... It can't escape them. When Mauricio Babilonia dies, the butterflies die with him. Meme lost track of the days. Much time had passed when she saw the last yellow butterfly destroyed in the blades of the fan, and she admitted as an irremediable truth that Mauricio Babilonia had died. The use of the yellow butterflies in Encanto might initially seem like just a reference to the book, but I would actually argue 
that Encanto isn't just referencing 100 Years of Solitude, but is instead in a sort of dialogue with it. In Encanto, Garcia Marquez's yellow butterflies, symbols of love that is doomed to be snuffed out by a cruel world, become symbols of life anew. Dos Oruquitas, two caterpillars that, in the face of change, thrive into something beautiful. Doom becomes survival. Abuelo Pedro died, but the butterflies didn't die with him. The love didn't die with him. That is why the Madrigals realized that the miracle they received wasn't the magical house, nor their magical gifts. The miracle is that after all these years, the family has somehow figured out how to thrive in the face of tragedy, surviving when you seem almost cosmically predisposed to keep suffering forever, century upon century. Encanto indulges in the fun, the color, the joy of Colombia. In its unique musical stylings, its delicious food, and its rich storytelling tradition. Because if these are the wonderful things that we have to share, even after everything that we have been through, isn't that a miracle in and of itself? We see how bright you burn. We see how brave you've been Now see yourself in time You're the real gift, kid. Let us in. The Madrigal's mistake all along, just like the Buen Dias before them, was thinking that they had to do this alone. That they all had this unshareable burden that they each had to bear all by themselves. But no, maybe we don't have to do this alone. Maybe we aren't really condemned to 100 years of solitude after all. Maybe we do get a second opportunity on Earth. And who knows, maybe the answer really is in each other. really is in each other. <laughs> Hello! It's a sign. It really is in each other. Didn't show your butt. This is YouTube.